ಶ್ರೀಮನ್ನಾರಾಯಣ ಶ್ರೀಮನ್ನಾರಾಯಣ ಶ್ರೀಪದಮೇಶರಣು ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕಾಂಪ್ಲೆಕ್ಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಮೆನಿ ಕಾಂಪ್ಲೆಕ್ಸ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಕಾಂಪ್ಲೆಕ್ಸ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಕಾಂಪ್ಲೆಕ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮೋಲ್ ಮೆನಿ ಬುಕ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ರಿಟನ್ ಆನ್ ವೇರಿಯಸ್ ಕಾಂಪ್ಲೆಕ್ಸ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಕಾಮನ್ಲಿ ಫೌಂಡ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಇಸ್ ಹೌ ಡಿಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ ಕಮ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಬೀ ಹೌ ಬಿಗ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ ವೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಆರ್ ಅರ್ಥ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸ್ how did all the stars appear how did man evolve will all this stay as is where will the universe go from here these very questions their range and depth have rattled us for long many thinkers who have thought beyond this world have asked the same questions and have tried to give answers for their times for their civilization Today we all understand that our earth is a part of a solar system with sun at the center and earth as well as other planets revolving around it. We also know about other stars and galaxies made of many stars and are still wondering how all this came to be. But for the medieval thought of West Asia and Europe, their whole thinking was that the world was earth-centric or geocentric. based on a concept that the world sun moon stars and the universe were created by god in 6 days with god taking rest on the 7th day this thought finds its roots in the book of genesis of 500 bce it was thought that the world was created by god about 4000 years before the birth of christ this thought was further clarified and cemented in the year 1664 ce by reverend james usher archbishop of ireland in his declaration which gave a specific date in the gregorian calendar for when god created this earth he proclaimed that the date of creation was 23rd october 4004 bc at 9 am this emphatic statement of reverend james usher has ruled the scientific thought the histories and the education of the world for the next couple of centuries in fact even to this day this date 23rd october 4004 bce forms the benchmark for many a theological discussions on the subject of creation of this world this same thought was also depicted as a creation panel by the painter michelangelo at the sistine chapel in the vatican in 1500 ce it is this string of thought that has dominated our minds and education for the last couple of centuries Ancient civilizations of the world too have had their views on creation. The Assyrian civilization in 700 BCE speaks of the process of creation and the divinities Apsu and Tiamat who came out of the primordial waters. This can be seen in the cuneiform tablet excavated at Nineveh in northern Iraq. The Persian civilization also had similar stories of creation from cosmic waters in the form of the creation epic Atrahasis in 1500 BC itself. The Persian civilization had their creation stories around Tiamat and divinity Marduk. In 3000 BCE, the Babylonian civilization had their creation story. This can be found inscribed on a tablet called Enuma Elish. The English translation of the text speaks of the process of creation happening only after which the gods themselves were formed and names were given to different created bodies. This concept of Enuma Elish is carried in the book of Genesis on the story of creation where Elohim was the name of God. This story of Genesis is depicted in six scenes on the door of San Zeno Cathedral in Verona, Italy, thought to have been sculpted in 1138 CE This understanding of the concept of creation by the Babylonian civilization shows interesting shades of similarity with the concept of creation in the traditional Indian scriptures Most of the ancient civilizations such as Assyria, Babylonia, Egypt have lost their continuity and we are not able to understand the full purport of the creation stories of those lands On the other hand The continuity in India can still be seen in the language, the literature, the customs, calendar and social fabric of the land. If we look at the legends and the details in the Indian scriptures, 
they not only reveal to us that the stories of the origin of the universe seem to have amazing similarities with cutting edge discoveries of modern science today, but they also show us how the Indian thought has held forth on questions that the modern science is yet to answer. Given that a lot of ancient literature is still available and prevalent, it gives us an opportunity to peek into the thoughts and knowledge of the ancients to see if we can find answer to the most basic question that has been hounding mankind for centuries and millennia across the globe. How was this universe created? The process of creation is available to us today through the Veda, Purana and many other literary texts of ancient India. The primary body of knowledge of the Indians is the Veda. The Rig Veda is the oldest available literature in the world, last known to have been compiled in 3100 BCE by Veda Vyasa. It is a compilation of various rishi, seer scientists, their interaction with nature and their questioning of nature. A closer inspection of the Veda reveals that, while this interaction between the rishi and nature may have occurred well over 5000 years ago, the contents of the passage are valid to this date in our scientific world. Today, the modern world calls the process of creation as the Big Bang. In this modern scientific world, many labs such as the CERN Laboratory of Particle Physics in Geneva, Switzerland, and the Fermi National Laboratory in the United States have been conducting various experiments as to what really happened in the immediate moments after the Big Bang. The very concept of the Big Bang from the cosmic egg came into the scientific parlance because of the postulate put forth by the Belgian Roman Catholic priest, Abbe Georges Lemaitre, a mathematician and astrophysicist in the year 1927. His contemporary, Professor Albert Einstein, one of the greatest theorists of the modern world, had put forth his theory that this universe was formed as it is now and is static. He postulated and showed how, in this universe, energy and matter are interconvertible and the sum total of all energy and matter in the universe is always a constant. A couple of centuries earlier, the Dutch scientist Christian Huygens, in 1670 in his path-breaking book of those times, new conjectures concerning the planetary worlds, their inhabitants and their production, had made this very scientific and visionary statement for those times. What a wonderful and amazing scheme we have here of the vastness of the universe, so many suns and earths. This statement was very scientific and visionary for those times because it was the year 1664 CE and across the North Sea, Reverend James Usher, the Archbishop of Ireland, had just proclaimed that the world was created on 23rd October 4004 BCE at 9 a.m. in the morning. Each of the prominent ancient civilization seems to have thought of the process of creation and expressed it through stories befitting their times, their civilizations and the thought process then. The underlying basis and the differentiating factor for most of the religions seems to be its view on what is the source of creation or the origin of the universe. At Bharat Gyan, we have been working on the ancient knowledge base of India and one among the various subjects that we have been working on is the ancient Indian understanding of creation. What is amazing is the similarity of thought between the modern scientists and the traditional Indian Rishi on how this universe came to be. The Vedic Rishi were seer scientists of their times. There were at least over 400 of them. They all lived before 3000 BCE. One of the eminent Rishi, Rishi Parameshti, in his times seems to have asked this question how this universe and creation came to be. Rishi Parameshti's questioning and understanding of this process of creation is available to us today in the Nasadya Sukta of the Rig Veda. The Nasadya Sukta of the Rig Veda has this thought provoking and profound description of the process of creation. Nasada 
There was neither out nor not, no air nor sky. What covered all? Where rested all? A void in wrath. Who knows from whence this vast creation arose? No gods had been born. Who then can ever the truth disclose? Whence sprang the world, whether framed by hand divine or no? Lord in heaven alone can tell, if even he can show. A very true and poignant observation indeed, it brings out a few facets of the Veda. One, it has asked the most sublime of questions and looked for answers. Two, the Veda go beyond religion, for the gods must exist to create a religion. In the case of the Veda, it speaks of a stage when the gods themselves may not have existed. So the Veda is not a religious text but a scientific treatise. Rishi Parameshti, after having asked these questions, then goes on to explain the subsequent stages in the process of creation in the Nasadi Sukta of the Rig Veda. Taking cue from the words of Rishi Parameshti, we can realize that the personal gods had not been born then. For the next few minutes, we will be journeying into the very depths of the knowledge of creation. While the opening verse of the Nasadi Sukta starts with a very profound question. Did God create creation or was God also created as a part of the process of creation? This sukta then goes on to explain the concept of creation. That alone by its own power breathe without air. Besides or beyond that one there was nothing. What do we mean by breathing without air? Was it some sort of rhythmic alternating of states, like in breathing or in oscillation? Within that one appeared the first seed of mind in which arose an impulsive diffusion and concentration power. At this point arose the manifested universe from the unmanifested that one. These rays of concentrated power spread on all sides in the manifested mass. And from that arose the seeds of mind and they became greater. The power of the seeds of mind remained concentrated in them, while the pressure of concussion remained on the other hand. Nobody can describe the process of creation. Even the center of power, the Hiranyagarbha cannot tell, because there too, the detailed seeing mind of man did not exist. Hiranya means golden hued and Garbha means a womb. Hiranyagarbha means a golden-hued womb. What is this Hiranyagarbha all about and how does the process of creation start from here? Has it been explained in the text? And if so, how does it compare with the understanding gained in the world of modern science today? The Nasadya Sukta talks of a golden-hued womb, the Hiranyagarbha, an indescribable power or energy center which is an oscillation. The Sukta talks of this oscillation as a form of breathing activity which expresses itself as a pulsating Hiranyagarbha. What makes this Hiranyagarbha pulsate? The Rig Veda speaks of two forces, one which is an externally pushing force and the other a force which holds back or holds in. The tug of war between these opposing forces goes on for a period at a standstill because both space and motion do not exist. This is an intervening period between two Brahma creation cycles when time is immeasurable. The seer Rishi Hiranyastupa Angirasa has described the interplay between the forces as a battle between Indra and Vritra in the Rig Vedic hymns. During this tug of war between the two kinds of opposing forces, at a particular moment, Indra, the externally pushing force, overcomes Vritra the holding back force, causing the Hiranyagarbha to burst open and the universe to spring out. 
The Hiranyagarbha explodes and spews out manifested matter from which form the galaxies are Mandakini, stars and the rest of the universe. This breaking open of the Hiranyagarbha has been described as Brahmanda Visphotak or universal explosion which finds a similarity in the modern concept of the Big Bang. The Indian texts thus talk to us not only of what happened during creation but also what happened before creation. Besides cutting edge modern scientific research, the answers to the unending and unsolved quest of mankind could perhaps come from the Indian knowledge system that has been with us for 5,000 years and more. With this in mind, we met Dr. Archana Sharma, senior physicist in CERN, to interact and see parallels between traditional Indian concepts and the modern scientific view. It is now a commonly accepted scientific belief that the universe, namely space and time, was created with a Big Bang. So we are trying to study the history of this space and this time and how it all came to be. In pursuing an understanding of the working of the universe, we are trying to understand the fundamental forces of nature. Why the apple falls down and not up? Why do the stars shine at night? Why do all the planets revolve around the sun and why is the universe the way it is? How does the shine give energy? and why all this comes together to give life to you and me. In fact, we are looking for the instruction manual of the universe. The last hundred years have seen an acceleration in the pace of this progress towards understanding. With the discovery of X-rays, the humble electron, the proton, the neutron, and many such particles which have been found in experiments with cosmic rays that are the remnants of the Big Bang. These particles have been traversing the universe for 14 billion years, ever since the universe was created. And they provide us with clues to go closer and closer, backwards in time, to the point when the universe was created. In order to decipher these clues, we scientists have been conducting a large number of experiments. For example, taking hot air balloons up in the atmosphere, high up in the atmosphere, and using cosmic rays to bombard detectors, studying what we find over there, we use bubble chambers, cloud chambers, and eventually accelerators, which started from being tabletop, and now we have the 27 kilometer long Large Hadron Collider at CERN. With all these experiments, it is hoped that we will be able to recreate the Big Bang, albeit in a very small scale, to understand and tie up the loose ends of the creation story. For us scientists, it is the Big Bang that holds the key to unlock the secrets of the universe. It's the Big Bang that spewed out constituents of matter that make me, you and all the nature around us. Could it be that the instruction manual of the universe that we're all seeking is available in the ancient Indian texts? If only we care to see. If only we effort to understand their point of view and language. The fight between Indra and Vritra, which is a scientific happening inside the Hiranyagarbha before its opening up, has been wrongly understood by some colonial historians as a fight between the Aryans and Dravidians. Vritra has loosely and erroneously been equated with the Dravidians and Indra as an Aryan, under whose leadership the victorious Aryans entered the fertile plains of India. Over 100 or 200 years ago, when the concept of cosmic egg was still unknown in the scientific perspective, these historians had misapplied this concept of Indra Vritra fright, and they brought it down all the way from the cosmic egg to the floor of the earth. They had wrongly fitted it into a colonial theory of Aryan invasion, which has since been totally debunked. One of the recognized commentators of the Veda, Professor Norman Brown, also expresses his opinion of this fight between Indra and Vritra that takes place in the cosmic waters of the Hiranyagarbha. He says it is a fight that separates Sat from Asat at the time of creation of this universe. The concept of the cosmic egg and the Big Bang in the modern world 
is less than 100 years old. It is therefore very intriguing how the ancient Vedic Rishi had divined the concept of Hiranyagarbha and their explanation of the process of creation is very similar to that of this cosmic egg and how it burst open to create this universe. The ancient Indian seers have connected with the event of the Brahmanda Visphotak or the Big Bang through Om, the sound created by the Big Bang which has since been reverberating throughout the universe. This Om is called Pranava or the primordial sound, the breath of the universe. A major breakthrough in our understanding of the workings of the universe came about when two physicists in 1978, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson discovered an ever-pervading microwave background radiation. This lent credibility to the fact that we are mere remains of an event that happened far beyond our comprehension of space and time. This cosmic wave background is a reverberation of that event and serves as a constant reminder of that event, namely the Big Bang. Isn't this similar to the concept of Ohm? The Puranas used personages with apt names and roles as divinities to depict the various fields, forces and energies in play before, during and after the process of creation. In the Indian pantheon of such divinities, on the top are the Trinity, they being Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva for their respective roles of creation, sustenance and dissolution. There is also Narayana, a primordial divinity who is usually depicted as lying supine on a bed of snake in the cosmic waters known as Shirasaga. What is this metaphor of Narayana lying in these waters? Who is this Narayana? Etymologically, when we look at the name Narayana, we have two components to it. One is Naraha and the other is Ayana. Naraha means waters and Ayana is one who is resting in. So Narayana is one who is at rest in these waters. That is why Narayana is shown symbolically as reclining and residing in cosmic waters. It is from these cosmic waters that the universe, the forces of nature and the divinities emanate from. Lakshmi, the embodiment of wealth, also has her origins in the same primordial waters. She has no biological parentage. Lakshmi denotes success, prosperity and wealth. In these primordial waters, the Triguna or three universal characteristics namely Rajas, Tamas and Sattva are neutralized, dormant and life patent. Primordial nature is thus said to be Trigunatmika Prakriti or a three characteristic based nature. In the scientific world today, the process of the Big Bang or the process of creation is explained using the model called the standard model. This has been devised using experiments and observations about us, about the stars, about galaxies and the cosmic rays that come down to the earth from the cosmos. The standard model permits going back in time to the moment when the universe began, namely the moment of the Big Bang. The frontiers of science and research have been able to give us hints of the state of the universe as it existed 14 billion years ago at an unimaginably small fraction of time after the Big Bang when all matter was in the form of a primordial soup. The present understanding is that the universe works on the basis of four fundamental forces electromagnetism, strong force, weak force and gravity and together they hold the planets in their place. They make the sun and the stars shine every day and every night. In the primordial soup, which is a sea of quarks and gluons, these fundamental forces came into play. The standard model postulates, before this point in time, there were no distinct forces, rather all forces were rolled into one. All the constituent particles were deconfined in this primordial soup. What does that mean? It means that they were moving freely without the action of any force upon them. What a wonderful convergence of thought here between Narayana and the primordial soup. 
But why is Narayana always shown reclining on a bed of a coiled snake called Adisesha? This is shown in various forms of literature, art and craft. What is this name Adisesha? Do all these names have any scientific meaning? To understand the enigma of Adisesha, let us go to the root of the word. Adi means beginning and Sesha means remnant. Thus Adisesha is a remnant of an earlier cycle of creation. Adisesha is always represented as a coiled serpent with five heads. It represents the endless cycles of creation and dissolution by its ability to uncoil and coil itself back. Adisesha is shown to bear Narayana in his coiled bed, Narayana in a reclining pose. This Narayana takes us back to the start of the creation process where within the cosmic waters lies Narayana or the state of inertness and tham as we saw earlier. Adisesha and Narayana are thus symbolic of the state of the cosmos between any two successive cycles of creation. The endlessness of these cycles have been brought forth by the name Ananta Sesha for Adisesha where Ananta means infinite. Dr. Roger Penrose, the eminent theoretical physicist, also seems to be echoing exactly the same views in scientific terms in his statement. The Big Bang in a certain sense is not the beginning. The big final stage may also be the initial stage when there is only radiation left and the universe loses track of its scale. Normally, a snake has only one head, but Adisesha has five heads. Does this also have a scientific significance? The five heads denote the five primordial states of matter from the previous cycle of creation. Narayana and Adisesha in the primordial waters embody the five basic elements of this universe. How can we say with any authority that it is only five elements? The ancient Indian word for the universe is prapancha. Pancha means five and pra denotes special, in this case primordial. So from this very word prapancha, it is evident that the universe is made up of five primordial elements. These five primordial or basic elements, bhuta, were termed as pancha bhuta or the five states of matter and they were akasha, space or ether, vayu, air, tejas, fire, upper, water and prithvi, earth. The understanding of this is given in various Vedic and Upanishad statements as to how man has the ability to understand and appreciate the five basic elements of the universe with his five senses. First was Akasha, space, ether, through which we hear Shabda, sound. Next is Vayu, wind. We can hear wind and also feel it. Then Tejas, Agni, fire. We see, hear and also feel the heat of fire. Apaha, water. Water can be seen, heard, felt and also tasted. Finally, Prithvi or Earth evolves where we can hear, touch, see, taste as well as smell it. This smell proliferates the air soon after it rains on a dry ground. The five states of matter have been described such that each successive state of matter contains properties of all its preceding ones. Om these five elements are the very essentials of life of the universe. It is these five states of matter that give rise to the five senses and the experience that arises from it. The concept of evolution of the Panchabhuta giving rise to favorable conditions 
for experiences and life has been depicted through the deity Shiva, who is symbolized and revered as the embodiment of Panchabhuta. This concept is symbolically represented through Panchabhuta temples for Shiva in South India. Legends based on scientific concepts keep the interest and faith in these temples alive with the hope that through this interest in Shiva, mankind will also remember and revere the very life-giving scientific concept of the Panchabhuta. We often hear of the divinity Brahma, who is called the creator. He is sitting on a lotus which has for its stem an umbilical cord emanating from the navel of Padmanabha. Who is this Brahma and who is this Padmanabha? The state of Narayana gives way to Padmanabha. The dormant lying state of Narayana transforms itself to the Padmanabha state when the creation is to take place. This is symbolically shown as Padmanabha. The word Padmanabha can be broken down as Padma meaning lotus and Nabha relating to the navel. Padmanabha, the one who has a lotus emerging from his navel. Seated on this lotus is Brahma. The etymological root of the word Brahma, which is Bra, means to expand or grow. Grow in terms of size, extent, content and complexity. In short, evolve. Brahma stands for the created universe which emerged from the Big Bang and keeps evolving continuously. It is a scientific naming for a function or characteristic of this universe in an evolving subject which is also growing and expanding on its own. The created also becomes the creator in the subsequent stages of creation. Hence, Brahma is the created and also the creator. Thus, Padmanabha shows that Brahma, the creator, is also created and emanates from Narayana, the primordial waters. Padmam or Kamalam, the lotus flower. Why is Brahma shown sitting on a lotus emanating from the navel of Padmanabha to create this prapancha or the universe? What is the significance of the lotus flower here? Why couldn't it have been a rose, a jasmine or tulip or any other flower? If you look at how a lotus flower grows, it provides a very interesting analogy. A lotus grows out of the waters. It has got a long, flexible, winding stem which supports the flower to bloom just on the surface of the water. Whether the water rises up or goes down in height, the stem adjusts itself in such a way that the flower does not drown itself in the waters and holds it just above the water level so that the lotus bud can receive the energies from the sun and blossom. From a pan-global perspective too, in every ancient civilization, be it India, Egypt or Mexico, the life-giving aspect is always denoted by a lotus flower. There is a reason why so many civilizations of the world have associated the lotus flower with life. If we look all around us, we will observe that while life and constituents of life originate from a source of heat, for the life to take birth and to be sustained, it has to distance itself away just right enough from the source of heat. While the sun is the source of all planets and earth, there is no life as we know it on the sun. Only earth away from the sun and at cooler temperatures than the sun is able to bear and sustain life as we know it. Similarly, the life-giving spermatozoa in mammals of the animal kingdom are placed in a scrotal sac just outside the body so that they are maintained at the right temperature, away from the heat of the body to keep their life-generating potential sustained. This design is truly a marvel of nature. After the explosion of the Hiranyagarbha, Brahma brings forth life in this universe. How life is not destroyed in this fierce process of creation is symbolically shown as a lotus growing, adjusting its stalk and moving away in a congenial conditions for life to sprout forth. There is a particular variety of lotus flower in India called Brahma Kamalam. Its flowering sequence is interesting and seems akin to the process of Hiranyagarbha pulsating for a long time 
and finally bursting open once a year and once it opens up, the flower withers away within a couple of hours of its flowering. We too have evolved after a very long time since the Big Bang. After the Big Bang, we understand that the universe expanded instantaneously and took a long time to cool before life could evolve. The life of the Sun and Earth and all of us is just a fraction of the life of the universe or Brahma, just like the Brahma Kamalam flower, which goes through a lot of hibernation and preparation before it blooms and even then stays in bloom for just a few hours. This aspect of the instantaneous expansion of this universe has been beautifully brought forth in an interesting legend in our Shiva Purana. In the instant after the Brahmanda Visvatak or the Big Bang, there arose a dialogue between the two that were present then. Brahma the creator or the expanding force and Vishnu the sustaining force. The dialogue between Brahma and Vishnu arises because Brahma the first created has also the same doubt as we do as to where he came from and he asked Vishnu for an answer. Vishnu responds that it is he who gave birth to Brahma. Not finding the answer satisfactory, Brahma and Vishnu have an argument and each displays their potential powers. At that instant, they see a third, which is a column of flame. Both Brahma and Vishnu decide to investigate the source of this flame and each go in either directions to trace the source of the column of flame. Both Brahma and Vishnu search for the ends but are unable to reach the ends of this column. Then they come back to meet each other which is when they realize that this column of flame to be the third that is Shiva. This carving shows Brahma going upwards and Vishnu going downwards in search of the two ends of the column and then realizing Shiva at the center. This scientific event apart from being said in the story of Shiva Purana is also shown in the carvings the classic one being the carving of Shiva Lingot Bhava. This symbolic story of the movement soon after creation tells us two things. One, the expansion of the universe was instantaneous and the ends of it unfathomable. Two, from the minutest to universal in size, the growth was instantaneous. This beautiful and profound carving that is kept in almost every Shiva temple to remind people of the forces of creation has in the last few centuries been unfortunately dubbed by some historians as the phallic symbol. This symbolic profound story of Shiva Purana finds an echo in the modern scientific understanding of the instantaneous expansion of the universe after the Big Bang. The present understanding of the origins of the universe relate to the Big Bang, namely that at that point of time all energy was concentrated in a space which was equivalent to the tip of a needle and the temperatures there were trillions of times higher than those at the heart of the sun. With the Big Bang, rapid and instantaneous expansion took place when all this energy was converted into the primordial soup of which matter as we know today emerged. The universe was thus formed in an instant to this infinite size. From then on, it's been cooling and expanding gradually. The quest to know how creation happened has not been limited to Brahma, the first created, and to us alone. In between, many people in many civilizations have repeatedly asked this question and looked for answers. One instance of specific, rational, logical, scientific questioning can be seen in the Vishnu Purana. Here, Rishi Maitreya asks Rishi Parashara nine very specific questions. What are the causes that led to the creation of the universe? How shall it ultimately dissolve into pralaya? How was this earth created? What is the limit of the sky? What is the basis on which the earth stands? What props up the sun and other heavenly bodies? What is the scale of their measure? How is the time divided? What decides the final dissolution? The way these questions have been asked 
and their order shows the logical mind of the questioner. The answers given by Rishi Parasara are in a chapter called Anda Kaustubha. Anda meaning egg and Kaustubha meaning understanding its effulgence. Not only is the process of creation mentioned in Anda Kaustubha, it also has a chapter titled Shakti Panjara which gives interesting details of the energies that have been released in the process of creation. All this understanding of creation has been repeatedly brought forth in different sukta or chapters of the Veda. Nasadiya Sukta, which describes the process of creation. Hiranyagarbha Sukta, which describes the happenings inside the cosmic egg or the Hiranyagarbha. Apaha Sukta, which speaks of the primordial waters where the three guna or properties are neutral, patent and life-sustaining for the universe. Vishwakarma Sukta, which speaks about how the divine forces of nature frame these worlds and Purusha Sukta. Om Tasmat Virada Jajata Virada Adhipurjaha Sajata Atterichata Paschat Bhavivata Puraha Om The statement in Purusha Sukta is very enigmatic. It provides a very unique perspective of the recursive progression of celestial bodies all the way down from the Hiranyagarbha to our galaxy to our sun, the solar system, earth and the moon. This highlights the clarity in understanding of the order of magnitude and influence of the various celestial bodies way back by the ancients thousands of years ago, much before modern science accepted a heliocentric solar system. The other ancient texts of India, the 18 Puranas too, by their very structure and format, have to speak about creation as the opening section of the Puranas. Apart from these, many other texts of India, such as Samarangana Sutradhara by Raja Bhoja, written around 1000 CE, an engineering and technology treatise, Brihat Samhita, a compendium of many subjects like mathematics, astronomy, etc., written by Varaha Mihira around 530 CE, Manuspriti, an undateable ancient text which speaks about the codes of living all describe the process of creation in a scientific manner with examples and styles of their own times. Krishna who lived around 3100 BCE in his Sankhya view while describing the Vyuha concept beautifully and clearly brings out the stages of creation through the concept of Vasudeva, Sankarsana, Pradyumna and Aniruddha. Etymologically, these four names denote the scientific process in each stage of creation. Vasudeva means that which exists and shines. It is the state of a Hiranyagarbha in a quizzed and dormant condition. Sankarshana comes from the root Sankocha, meaning pullback. This represents that state when the Hiranyagarbha is under the influence of alternating, expanding and contracting forces, the state of tug of war between Indra and Vritra. Pradyumna comes from the root Dhyama meaning flash. This state represents the explosion of the Hiranyagarbha. Aniruddha comes from the roots Nirudh meaning control. Anirudh means out of control and denotes the state when the universe expands as though out of control soon after the explosion. Each of these names have been assigned as names of divinities and people are named after these divinities in India even today. We see an underlying vein in all these texts, a scientific explanation of the process of creation. They are not religious texts as perceived. They expound the process of creation from a scientific and spiritual perspective. A couple of years ago, an avid student of cosmology asked a question of Professor Stephen Hawking, one of the foremost theoretical physicists of our times. The question was, what existed before the universe began? To which Professor Hawking replied, it is a meaningless question. While this question was very searching, 
The answer was also very safe and correct from the knowledge that we have today with us based on the modern understanding of cosmology, creation and the Big Bang. The seer, the ancient Rishi of India, also have thought about this question and have expressed their answers in the form of allegories and metaphors. Thus, we have today Narayana and Adisesha, the five hooded snake, to represent that creation starts on the bed of the previous cycle of creation, from the vestiges of the five primordial elements from the previous cycle of creation. The snake also represents the endlessness of the cycles of creation. The process of manifestation of matter and the universe is termed as Panchi Karnam in the text. Pancha means five and Karnam means to do or to act. Panchi Karnam represents the interplay between the five. The five Panchabhuta or the five primordial elements as we have seen before. Chadogya Upanishad while describing the process of creation says Seyam Devata Aikshata Hantaha Mimas Tisro Devataha Anena Atmana Anupravishya Namo Rupe Vyakaravani Tasam Trivrutam Ekaika Makarotu This is the concept of Trivrut Karana which further has been developed into Panchi Karana Panchi Karana means simply five elements originally embedded in Hiranyagarbha, the Samashti Purusha, were in their pure state. But however, for the process of creation to take place, there was a mixture done. That is, the first element, Akasha, 50% of it was retained and the balance 50% was got from 12.5% from Vayu, 12.5% from Agni, Tejas, 12.5% from Water and 12.5% from Earth. Similarly, all other four elements followed. That is, for the process of Srishti creation to take place, it was essential to have mixture of the five elements in this form. This is called Panchi Karana. One may ask if it's possible for such alignments and bonding to happen. Modern physicist Dr. Archana Sharma also sees a distinct similarity between the process of Panchi Karnam and the modern developments in physics. All our experiments to search for the secrets of how creation took place have revealed the presence of tiny constituents of particles in the quark gluon plasma or the primordial soup. There's just one piece missing in this jigsaw puzzle, the existence of which we are able to predict with a great deal of accuracy and confidence. That is the Higgs boson or the God particle. Analysis shows it must be the appearance and presence of this God particle which must have triggered the free-floating massless particles in the cosmic soup to start acquiring mass and start to interact with one another to finally form the matter in the entire universe. Under the influence of the Higgs field, three quarks group together to make up a stable proton and many other particles which form the constituents of matter. These are formed within nanoseconds after the Big Bang. All our efforts to simulate conditions of the Big Bang at the Large Hadron Collider, though on a very minuscule scale, is with the hope that we can recreate such God particles just as we believe they should have appeared soon after the Big Bang. A few minutes later, simple atoms followed by simple molecules were formed like those of hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen in ratios that are same even today. Elements and compounds followed and clumps of matter started appearing. The expansion continued and clumps grew into galaxies. Stars and planets followed with the eventual appearance of the world as we know it today. Isn't it amazing what carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and hydrogen can do when put together for 14 billion years? The Veda therefore 
have explained the process of creation as evolution of matter from paravastu to vastu or subtle to gross. The ancient Rishi have thus explained the most critical step in the process of creation by approaching it from subtle to gross in contrast to the modern scientific approach of working from the gross. There are still many open questions puzzling us scientists. For example, when we measure all the matter in the universe and put it together in models by cosmologists, astronomers, astrophysicists and physicists, we can account only for 4%. Where is the 96% that's missing? Is it in the form of dark matter or is it in the form of dark energy? Is there another universe? Or are there multi-universes? Are there extra dimensions other than space and time? Isn't it amazing how we have come to exist out of mere energy for the mere excess of matter over antimatter? What are the properties of this antimatter? What are the properties of this primordial soup out of which all this nature and all of us came to be? Human curiosity is as old as mankind itself and pushing the frontiers of knowledge is what we scientists are trying to do with the help of technology. And the journey goes on. How on earth did the ancient Rishi, the seer scientist of India, understand all these concepts of creation in those ancient days? Answering this question may never be possible, but one probable answer could be in their statement, Yata Pinde Tata Brahmande, as in macrocosm, so in microcosm, where they could in a kaleidoscopic effort see the mathematical similarity of the process of creation of the universe from a microcosm to the macrocosm. Dr. Roger Penrose, mathematician and theoretical physicist, on his understanding of the process of creation, speaks of it as the final theory, where he says that the final theory, if it comes, must have beauty and simplicity, something I have not yet come across. The Europeans have been looking towards the East at regular intervals. Over 2000 years ago, for exotic spices, fine textiles, mathematics, zero, infinity and later over the last 200 years for oriental mysticism. In this millennia, a fresh look at science from the simple and sublime perspective of the oriental east could perhaps yield answers to the most enigmatic question of the universe. A rational, logical and a holistic approach intertwining the modern scientific research perspective of the west with the sublime view of the east could probably pave the way to answer the questions of all mankind. The description of the process of creation, starting even before the Big Bang, is what has been depicted as a tug of war between Indra and Vritra inside the Hiranyagarbha. In Purana, this event got morphed into the story of Samudra Manthan, which yields the pot of immortal nectar Amrita. This pot of nectar gave rise to the concept of Kumbh and the festival Kumbh Mela to commemorate the event of creation of the universe. This Kumbh festival is celebrated once every 12 years when Jupiter transits into Kumbh Rasi, Aquarius, the picture bearer zodiac. We see here a beautiful correlation between science, legend and astronomy across civilizations. The Kumbh is not just a bathing ritual but a profound festival instituted for mankind to congregate at regular intervals to discuss all aspects of knowledge from creation thereon and to relish this knowledge. It is a gateway to the knowledge of creation and all that has evolved from it. You may ask if the ancient Rishi had realized, relished and shared with us the knowledge of the process of creation in the form of the concept of divinities in the Veda, the Purana, 
in the scriptures and sculptures, then where is the need to do further scientific research and conduct expensive experiments to unravel the mysteries of the universe? The answer to this question lies in the Ishavasi Upanishad, one of the primary, equally ancient, explanatory texts of the Veda. The Ishavasi Upanishad had obviously thought of this question and had preemptively answered it many thousand years ago itself. We are advised by the text that the pursuit of the unmanifested reality, the spiritual sciences alone, or the pursuit of the manifested or the material sciences alone will lead us to further darkness and misunderstanding. This universe and the creation is a mix of both the manifested and the unmanifested and a healthy mix of understanding of both will give rise to a simple answer that Dr. Penrose is looking for. We had a heartbreaking moment in science with Einstein's revelation of the relation between mass and energy. How mass and energy are interconvertible and how the total mass and energy in the universe is a constant. With a combined understanding of creation from the material sciences perspective and the ancient spiritual expression of science, we can perhaps hope to reach the next path-breaking moment in mankind's pursuit of science, namely the unraveling of the relation between the manifested and the unmanifested, the relation between matter and consciousness, how the total of all matter and consciousness leads to the all-pervading prakriti or nature, the scientific divinity. Om Satyatyatya Bhavata Niruktanja Niruktanja The wish became a reality and it became the formed and the formless, the defined and the undefined, the sustaining and the non-sustaining, the sentient and the non-sentient, the true and the untrue. Oh, my.